Hello friends, and welcome to the Bible Paladin Bible Commentary. Jacob encounters two challenges today. One is the dreaded reunion with his brother Esau, from whom he stole his birthright. And the other is an unexpected wrestling match with an unknown assailant at night. Is it God? An angel. We'll see. Both of these stories continue to flesh out this person we know as Jacob, and may teach us something about our own relationships as well. And so the story begins right after Laban leaves Jacob, and he continues with his family back into Canaan. And so we ask the Lord to bless our reading of the sacred word. Jacob sent messengers ahead to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, with this message. Thus shall you say to my lord Esau, your servant Jacob speaks as follows. I have been staying with Laban and have been detained there until now. I own cattle, asses, and sheep, as well as male and female servants. I am sending my lord this information in the hope of gaining your favor. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We reached your brother Esau. He is now coming to meet you, accompanied by four hundred men. Jacob was very much frightened. In his anxiety, he divided the people who were with him, as well as his flocks, herds, and camels, into two camps. If Esau should attack and overwhelm one camp, he reasoned, the remaining camp may still survive. Then he prayed, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, you told me, O Lord, go back to the land of your birth, and I will be good to you. I am unworthy of all the acts of kindness that you have loyally performed for your servant. Although I crossed the Jordan here with nothing but my staff, I have now grown into two companies. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau. Otherwise, I fear that when he comes, he will strike me down and slay the mothers and children. You yourself said, I will be very good to you, and I will make your descendants like the sands of the sea, which are too numerous to count. After passing the night there, Jacob selected from what he had with him the following presents for his brother Esau. Two hundred she-goats, and twenty he-goats, two hundred ewes and twenty rams, thirty milch camels and their young, forty cows and ten bulls, twenty she-asses and ten he-asses. He put these animals in charge of his servants, in separate droves, and he told the servants, Go on ahead of me, but keep a space between one drove and the next. To the servant in the lead he gave this instruction, When my brother Esau meets you, he may ask you, Whose man are you? Where are you going? To whom do these animals ahead of you belong? Then you shall answer, They belong to your brother Jacob, but they have been sent as a gift to my lord Esau, and Jacob himself is right behind us. He gave similar instructions to the second servant, and to the third, and to all the others who followed behind the droves, namely, Thus and thus shall you say to Esau when you reach him, and be sure to add, Your servant Jacob is right behind us. For Jacob reasoned, If I first appease him with the gifts that precede me, then later, when I face him, perhaps he will forgive me. So the gifts went on ahead of him while he stayed that night in the camp. We start this section with Jacob essentially fearing for his life as he returns to the land of his ancestors. It's been 20 years, but him and his brother didn't exactly part on good terms. And you can read chapter 26 or check out this video to remind yourself as to why Esau wanted to kill his brother, and which is why Jacob left in the first place. And so he sends his scouts or messengers ahead of him to see what the land looks like. And indeed, Esau is there in Edom, and in fact is coming towards him with 400 men, most likely 400 armed men. And there's an old saying in the military that says there's no atheists in foxholes. And this refers to people turning to prayer in the heat of war when they begin to realize and think about their own mortality. So if Jacob was still on the fence about his relationship with the God of his fathers, we see now if he is really going to turn to God. But remember that Jacob is also cunning, so he covers all his bases. First, he divides up his caravan into two camps. At least half of them would be able to turn tail and run if his brother is indeed hostile. And then he turns to God and offers his best prayer yet. He begins by invoking God's name and the names of those he first called, his grandfather and father. Later, God will be referred to under his name as well, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He then reminds God of the personal promise he had made to him, that he would be good to him if he returned to the land of his relatives. And here comes the good part. Jacob acknowledges his own unworthiness and recounts the goodness that God has shown him in spite of it. He humbles himself before the Lord. He relays to God his fear, not only for himself, but also for his family, and asks God to save him. 
Finally, he recalls the promise that God had made to Abraham that will be fulfilled through him. This really is a good prayer and does illustrate how one might communicate with God and becomes a model of prayer afterwards. But Jacob is also Jacob. He is cunning and he realizes that God has been working through his own actions throughout this time. And so he separates a significant part of his flocks and camels. He's got 75 golden camels. Don't they look lovely, Jew? As a gift for Esau. And the purpose of these caravans is to appease his brother, buy him time, and to see what the intentions of his brother really are. And so when he sends the caravans and servants ahead of him, Jacob stays a night behind with his family. But this night will not be uneventful. In the course of that night, however, Jacob arose, took his two wives with the two maidservants and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had taken them across the stream and had brought over all his possessions, Jacob was left there alone. Then some man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When the man saw that he could not prevail over him, he struck Jacob's hip at its socket, so that the hip socket was wrenched as they wrestled. The man then said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He answered, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be spoken of as Jacob, but as Israel, because you have contended with divine and human beings and have prevailed. Jacob then asked him, Do tell me your name, please. He answered, Why should you want to know my name? With that, he bade him farewell. Jacob named the place Peniel, because I have seen God face to face, he said, yet my life has been spared. At sunrise, as he left Penuel, Jacob limped along because of his hip. That is why, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the sciatic muscle that is on the hip socket, inasmuch as Jacob's hip socket was struck at the sciatic muscle. Jacob moves his immediate family across the river, perhaps still trying to position them to best protect them from his brother Esau. And since the story comes right on the heels of him leaving his extended family and now hearing about his fear of his brother Esau, we are told that he was alone. And he is alone, not just physically, but also symbolically, as he really seems to have no family that he can count on. Even after we hear of his prayer, we have yet to hear God's response. This is a turning point in his life and one in which he feels the most alone. He left Canaan, basically as an exile for what he did to his father and brother. He fled his father-in-law Laban as a thief, never to return. And so he questions whether or not God is even still on his side. The language of what happens draws from some folkloric elements, as well as from the timeless hero's journey that I often talk about. Let us forget for a moment the question of who this mysterious figure is, because in the text, we are first only told that it was a man. Jacob, the trickster and hero, has left home and encountered trials in a foreign land, as all heroes must. But now he must return home and put into practice the lessons that he has learned from his journey and eventually transition into the father figure that he must become. Laban has appeared as one of his main antagonists, but now we are led to believe that Esau may be whom he must face. Instead, we have an unknown assailant who will be the true boss battle. The encounter occurs at night, and the man is blocking Jacob's path, his path to return home. Jacob is aware of the old myths, so he tries to discover the man's name for it was believed that to know one's name, one would gain power over them. They wrestle until morning, none seeming to get the upper hand, so the man dislocates Jacob's hip. However, he still doesn't get the upper hand and begs to be released once the sun is rising. At this point, Jacob asks for a blessing, and the man gives him a new name with an interesting meaning. The figure still refuses to give Jacob his name, but he does give him a blessing. Jacob interprets this as an encounter with God, and names the place as such. In trying to interpret this passage, the mysterious figure has been understood as God himself, an angel, or even a devil. So let's get the devil one out of the way first. We see an antagonist to our hero who approaches him to try and prevent him from crossing the river. Jacob is able to wrestle and resist his power throughout the night, and the figure appears to lose his power or to be afraid of the approaching dawn. Then he seems to play dirty by striking Jacob's hip and refuses to give his name. All of this seems uncharacteristic for God, but not unheard of for a demon, especially in their folklore. And yet he changes Jacob's name, which is an action typically reserved for the Lord alone. We are also told that he blesses him, although we are not told the nature of the blessing. And so let's take this apart a bit. 
There are stories in the Bible in which the Lord allows the devil to test his faithful, the most famous being that of Job. But there it is explicitly stated, and up until this point, God has typically done the testing himself. And while folklore outside of the scripture might favor the tale of a nocturnal demon attacking our hero, this really doesn't fit into our narrative either, not even based on other more supernatural stories throughout Genesis. So perhaps it was an angel. Hagar, after all, referred to the angel at the well as God himself, not being able to tell the difference. Also, we have seen the angels act as God's messengers and ambassadors a number of times, as they are able to speak on behalf of God. And finally, the prophet Hosea does refer to this story as well, referring to the man as an angel. However, there still may be a case for seeing this as an encounter with God himself. Let's first address why God didn't tell Jacob who he was. He would always announce his presence to Abraham, except, of course, that time that he didn't. In fact, that particular occasion may give some insight into this story, for that is when Isaac's birth was announced and God changed Abraham's name. If you recall that story, God first appeared with his angels and did not reveal who he was. It was only after Abraham and Sarah welcomed them with hospitality and he told them that they would finally get pregnant did Abraham realize who he was. Later, God tested Abraham, allowing him to believe that he must go through with the horrible act of sacrificing his own son. He stopped them, or rather an angel stopped him right at the last minute and then God spoke through the angel as if he were speaking himself. God's presence seeming to be fluid in this case. The action of the angels and that of God seemed to be interchangeable. It seems that this may be the case in this story as well, for Jacob still needs to pass the final test before returning home. And so God appears as a man or a messenger as he has done before. And Jacob is much more confrontational than Abraham the diplomat. And so they throw down and Jacob fights the man. Remember that Jacob was alone. He could trust no one, which is often the case with people who get by through deception. Whether Jacob was fighting an angel or God himself doesn't really matter. Ultimately, he was fighting against himself. He is indeed wrestling with divine and human beings, as his new name will suggest. He is wrestling with his own past and his place in God's plan. God stays with him throughout the night, and he doesn't leave him unchanged. Jacob is left crippled from this encounter both emotionally and physically. At this point, Jacob realized that this is God, and God acknowledges his successful trial by giving him a new name and blessing him. In the morning, he rises as a new man and not the trickster that he was before. Later, we are told that this place was at Bethel. Just as Jacob had encountered God here on his way to meet his wife, he now has another encounter and emerges a changed man. Now that he is contended with God, what more does he have to fear? And so let us now return to this fraternal union that he has been dreading. Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming, accompanied by 400 men. So he divided his children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants, putting the maids and their children first, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. He himself went on ahead of them, bowing to the ground seven times until he reached his brother. Esau ran out to meet him, embraced him, and flinging himself on his neck, kissed him as he wept. When Esau looked about, he saw the women and the children. Who are these with you? He asked. Jacob answered, They are the children whom God has graciously bestowed on your servant. Then the maidservants and their children came forward and bowed low. Next, Leah and her children came forward and bowed low. Lastly, Rachel and her children came forward and bowed low. Then Esau asked, What did you intend with all those droves that I encountered? Jacob answered, It was to gain my Lord's favor. I have plenty, replied Esau. You should keep what is yours, brother. No, I beg you, said Jacob. If you will do me the favor, please accept this gift from me, since to come into your presence is for me like coming into the presence of God, now that you have received me so kindly. Do accept the present I have brought you. God has been generous toward me, and I have an abundance. Since he so urged him, Esau accepted. Then Esau said, Let us break camp and be on our way. I will travel alongside you. But Jacob replied, As my Lord can see, the children are frail. Besides, I am encumbered with the flocks and herds, which now have sucklings. If overdriven for a single day, the whole flock will die. Let my Lord then go on ahead of me, while I proceed more slowly at the pace of the livestock before me and at the pace of my children, until I join my Lord in Seir. Esau replied, Let me at least put at your disposal some of the men who are with me. But Jacob said, For what reason? Please indulge me in this, my lord. So on the same day that Esau began his journey back to Seir, Jacob journeyed to Succoth. 
There he built a home for himself and made booths for his livestock. That is why the place was called Sakoth. Having thus come from Padam Aram, Jacob arrived safely at the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, and he encamped in sight of the city. The plot of ground on which he had pitched his tent he bought for a hundred pieces of bullion from the descendants of Hamor, the founder of Shechem. He set up a memorial stone there and invoked El, the god of Israel. I'm not sure everyone will agree with me on this, but from my experience, a conversion is rarely a 180 degree turn overnight. And I dare say that Israel doesn't change right away either. He still remains Jacob. And I think it's comical in the way that it talks about how he divides up his family, showing really where his love is. First, he puts forth his concubines or maidservants with their children. And then behind them, Leah and her children. And finally in the back, Rachel and her son, Joseph. And so if anyone's going to get the brunt of Esau's attack, it's going to be those in front. At least Jacob has the chivalry to go on ahead of all of them himself and talk to his brother before any of this happens. And so what does Esau do? Anyway, I started blasting. No, no, quite the opposite. Esau runs up to him, hugs him, and kisses him, and then he asks him about his family. Really? We got all worked up for that? So Esau is still just a big teddy bear. In fact, he's incredulous that Jacob has given him all these gifts. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, you keep them. I already got some sheep. But Jacob insists, and Esau says, okay. But then he invites him to travel with him and says, we're going on to Seir. Why don't you and your family and your flocks follow me? But Jacob is still distrustful. And so he says, no, we'll meet up with you later. Because Jacob really has no intention of meeting up with him later. In fact, he doesn't want to settle near Esau because he doesn't want to share his inheritance with him. Better that they don't stay too close to each other. So what can we take away from all this? For me, it is the aspect of prayer that seems to bring these narratives together. Both before and after the encounter with Esau, Jacob invokes the name of the Lord. The story of this reunion, however, is split by the encounter with God during the night. So this is where the meaning comes through. We see this encounter as being an answer to Jacob's prayer in a way that he does not expect. God will indeed protect him from his brother, but Jacob must still undergo his own trial, for his journey is not yet complete. He still must learn what it means to be a follower of God. One way of understanding the struggle that he undergoes might be in the words of San Juan de la Cruz, or St. John of the Cross, who speaks of the dark night of the soul in his book of the same name. This can be a time of pain and suffering that allows one to see themselves and their relationship with the divine in a new light. Juan de la Cruz writes, No matter how much individuals do through their own efforts, they cannot actively purify themselves enough to be disposed in the least degree for the divine union of the perfection of love. God must take over and purge them in that fire that is dark for them, as we will explain. Christians may interpret this as the grace of God that ultimately comes through the suffering and death of Jesus. But this also can be seen as a moment of intense self-reflection in which God shows a person their own unworthiness and the realization that they cannot be redeemed without God. Jacob may have entered into his own dark night of the soul that night, but this was only the beginning. His dislocated hip joint shows that he will still suffer and endure conflict throughout his life if he is to follow the Lord. Many Christians talk about being born again, or that moment when they have turned their lives over to the Lord. But for many, that also is just the beginning of a lifetime of change, and a journey to become closer to God. This was Jacob's moment, and he doesn't change overnight. We can see that with the interaction that he has with his brother. And yet, this moment was a time for him to realize what he could become as Israel. As Juan de la Cruz also writes, God leads into the dark night those whom he desires to purify from all these imperfections so that he may bring them farther onward. This movement onward is the beginning of a new life. As we think of our own trials and struggles, both with others as well as with God, or with our faith, we might think of those dark nights of the soul. We have all sinful inclinations and attitudes that can still be cleansed, that we want to rid ourselves of, or at least keep in check. Walking in that path can be difficult, and we may even stumble. Jacob's injury is a symbol of that struggle even after we have chosen to walk the right path, after we have been saved, so to speak. Even those dark nights in our life can be an opportunity to see the grace and presence of God, even if at first we feared it may be something much more sinister. Wrestling with God, or even questioning aspects of our faith, is not a bad thing, and can in fact be the first step toward deepening one's relationship with a God that is more personal and powerful than we ever imagined. 
Thank you for joining me today, and I hope that you found this inspiring or at least interesting. And so please join me next time as we continue to see Jacob's family struggle, especially as his children grow into adulthood. And so there are some quite interesting adventures to be had. And so until then, pray intensely and do good.